as we look at, um, yes, actually a, a whole lot of what we've been looking at, all right, in this time, in this season, in this, um, okay. Yes. Yeah, a whole lot of um, a whole lot of um, 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 things we've been looking at in this season, you see. Um, and as a matter of fact, every every operation of the kingdom, every um, understanding, you know, of all eternal, you know. Um, 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 existence all eternal operations of god you see are built are built on the revelation of god's love built on the revelation of the love of god you see and when you talk about the love of god it's not a subject you see the love of god is not a subject it's it's not a topic it's not a bible topic not at all you see one of the one of the good let me put it this way one of the good you can do for yourself you see one of the good that you can do for yourself you see as a believer you know haven't come into you know relationship you know haven't come alive to god is to make sure you make sure that your heart you see your heart is 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 grounded in the revelation understanding revelation understanding of the love of god of the love of god you you have to make sure that you see that revelation of god's love is 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 heavy in your heart. You have to make sure that um, you are forever in that, you know, in that state. By reason of the revelation of God's love, you are forever in that state of, 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 of in divine intoxication by the love of God or of the love of God. You have to make sure. You have to make sure. You see, you know, when you, when you see believers who. Um, who from time to time, you know, you know, go through, you know, you know, seasons of, you know, depression, you know, who from time to time wonder, you know, about whether someone loves them, wonder about what people think of them, you know, you, 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 you know, what you are seeing, all right, is an example of someone who is who has a deficient understanding or who is deficient in his or her understanding of the revelation of God's love. You see, when you see a believer who has complex issues, you know, who takes seriously what people think of him or her, you see, who allows what people's opinion of him or her, you know, influence, inform how he or she, all right, conducts himself. You know, it's the same thing when you see a believer who is living a life, you know, of, um, of, um, of, you know, of, of, um, uh, um, is living like a life informed by, you know, the applause of men. You see, the applause of men, and interestingly, it is also what makes a believer to tell a lie. You know, when a believer lies, when a believer lies, it is the fear, the fear of men the fear of men, the horn of men, you know, what men will think of me as contrary, as contrary or as against what God thinks of you. You see, the revelation of God's love, the revelation, you know, I love the way um, Apostle John puts it. When he says perfect love, it means matured love. You see, love, love, you see, at different levels, at different levels of your work, of my work with God, all right, love, be, all right, is perfected at different levels, all right? 
it doesn't matter what level you are in, all right, at that level, at every stage of spiritual progression, all right, love, all right, reaches a place of perfection, reaches a place of divine overflow. So that's what John was saying. This operation, this revelation understanding, you see, of the love of God, all right, that is the person of God, that is the overflow of God's love, all right, reaching a point of divine overflow at every stage of your journey, at every stage of your spiritual development, all right? John says, is what destroys fear. Fear. Now, you see, fear isn't just, um, you know, you know, um, you know, quivering away from Satan. Fear basically speaks, or fear basically means, all right, the lack of consciousness of God. You see, the consciousness, the awareness of another reality, the consciousness or the awareness of another person as against the divine consciousness, the righteousness consciousness of God. So John says it is love when it reaches this overflow at the different stages of your work with God that destroys fear, that destroys that awareness, that consciousness to another, that awareness of another, that consciousness, you know, to another thing, to another reality, or that awareness of another reality, of another person, as against the consciousness of God, as against the awareness of his presence, of his glory. So John says it is love that destroys that, destroys that. That destroys that glory to God. That destroys that. You know, when the believer is uncertain, you know, the uncertainties that comes to believers, the un of all kinds, the uncertainty that comes to believers about whether or not God will answer my prayer. You know, you've prayed and you're wondering how you are hoping it will happen. <laughs> you are anxious. That's not even divine hope. There is a divine hope. You see, there is the hope of God, but that other hope, it's not, it's anxiety, where you are anxious, wondering, will God answer, has God answer, will it work? I hope it works. Oh, if God can do it, I'll be very happy. If God can do it, I will give a very powerful testimony. <laughs> you know, those blackmail, you know, those blackmail. So all of such uncertainties, even about the future, the uncertainties, you see, about what will happen to us, what's going to... John says it is the love of God, the revelation of, of love, the person of God, that person, that person of God, the revelation, you see, of that person of God, you see, reaching, reaching, reaching a peak, reaching an overflowing point, reaching a tipping point, all right, at the different stages of your work, at the different, you know, progressive stages of your journey, John says, is what destroys, is what dematerializes, is what annihilates. Fear, glory to God, glory to God. So the subject of God's love you see, which is powerfully connected to, you know, our, our redemption is not a topic. It's not a topic you, um, you treat. It's not a topic you, 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 you know, a class you, you go through, you know, that you say, oh, you have gone through that class, you know, when, you know, 16 years ago, you know, in the first year of my, my salvation, you know, it's been 17 years now, or, you know, 22 years ago, you know, the first year. So, you know, I've been saved now for 23 years. So the, the, the very first year was when I completed the class of God's love. So, you know, so my, <laughs> or you say, oh, the last time, um, 41 years ago, and you know, I've been saved now for 42 years, you know. No, <laughs> no, no. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory to God forever. Forever. All right, now, um, so you see, um, this brings us into what we've been looking at, all right, in relation to mastering 
supernatural leadings. Mastering it. Now, in the last um, time we had together, we, you know, looked at a couple of things, you know, foundationally in relation to um, the, 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 the things that, you know, guarantees, that ensures, you know, um, divine leaders, that ensures, you know, uh, um, 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 you know, I think I, I think I call them two important factors that are responsible for you know um, 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 supernatural leadings in the life of a believer. In the life of you know a believer. Now we talked about the important you know revelation understanding of the character of God, the revelation of the character of God, the character of God, the goodness of God, the revelation of God's love. You see, so we said it is first and foremost a function, <clears throat> right? Supernatural leading is first and foremost a function of the character of God. You see, it is first and foremost a function of the character of God. Now, and there is so much we can go on, which we'll continue to do during this series. We'll come to it from time to time, touch on it from time, because you can't go on. It doesn't matter how far you go, all right? You must come back to touch on it, all right? That, so from time to time, we'll keep coming back to talk on, you know, um, that revelation of the person, the character of God. You see, there is, is that's, that is the trigger. That's divine revelation of God's person, of his character, all right, is the trigger, all right? is the trigger for all eternal existence, is the trigger for all eternal operation, all, all exist, existence, you see, throughout all of the endlessness, continuous expanding endlessness of eternities. You see, every, every existence, every, existence, whether it speaks of, um, you know, places, whether it speaks of beings, whether it speaks of realities, you see, whether it speaks of realms, dimensions, all right, it doesn't matter what it is, all right, all, all right, are triggered by that, you know, revelation, that living pulsating, it is pulsating, every existence everywhere, all right, functions, leaves around that, you know, that's that living, you know, pulsating person of God, that living, you know, tangible expression of the person of God, his character, his nature. And that's the reason why you look at the scriptures throughout the scriptures, throughout, all right, from the first book of the Bible to the very last. Locked up within the core, all right, wrapped up within the core of every story, of every incident, you see, of ev every word, every sentence, every parable. You see, captured in the scriptures, all right, is that living, pulsating, tangible expression of the person of God, the essence of God, the character of God. You see, that is the reason, that is the reason why nothing, listen carefully, that is the reason why nothing, nothing can go wrong. Nothing, listen carefully. That is the reason why nothing can go wrong in all the realms of the kingdom of God. Nothing can go wrong, nothing. And the day, the day, you see, the day something went wrong, the day something went wrong, all right, within one of the living, you know, personality, one of the, you know, living beings, you see, that had gained life from God, 
the day something went wrong, the first day anything went wrong within this being, that was the day that sin, scripture says, sin was conceived. You see, and the day that happened, the day that happened, you see, the, 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 the judgment, you see, the judgment determination, the cutting off of that manifestation called sin, you see, and of the being within whom it was conceived was immediately taken care of. You must understand that. It is the reason why God, God did not lift a finger. God did not lift a finger. Did not lift a finger to take care of Lucifer. You see, when he fell, he didn't take, he didn't lift, lift a finger. No war broke out. Do you understand? As against what is, you know, believed, contrary to what is believed, you know, the interpretation, you know, many believers have of Revelations chapter 12. Now, we've said this many times, that Revelations chapter 12, all right, is not, is not a depiction of Satan's first fall. You see, Revelations chapter 12, all right, is not a depiction of Satan's first fall. You see, in the first, you know, original fall of Satan, you see, from Lucifer to Satan, you see, from being a manifestation and a participator of the assembly of God's arrays of light, all right, into becoming the manifestation of darkness, God did not lift a finger. Didn't lift a finger. This living, you know, pulsating, tangible manifestation of his essence that is at the core of every living existence fixed the problem immediately. It, it's automatic. It's, 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 I think the better word is not automatic, it's organic. It's organic. Organically took care of the whole situation. Took care of it. No war, no battle broke up. No, 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 no. Satan was fixed. <laughs> it was fixed. You see, as it is contrary belief, Michael did not lift a sword in defense of God. You see, no. What you see in Revelation 12 about Michael, all right, in, con in, in, you know, in battle with, you know, the dragon, all right, is, is, is something else, like we said, about the book of Revelation, all right, it is within the context. You see, it is within the map of the progression. You see, the progressive movement of sins into perfection. So there's a connection between the progressive movement of saints into perfection and what you see in Revelation chapter 12, which is something we're going to look at, you know, later in an ongoing series we've been doing now for, in a couple of weeks that we call Kingdom Priesthood. We've been doing that every Sunday. So you see, when the believer, when the believer, you know, um, comes to experience, comes to experience, you know, um, the love of God, by that I'm talking about the new birth, when the believer comes into that, um, you know, that place of awareness, you know, comes to, you know, receive life, comes to be made alive unto God, you see, what he experiences what he experiences, you see, as an expression of God's love by which he is awakened unto God, you see, is a manifestation of the character, nature, and person of God. You see, that is what 
Jesus. That is what Jesus came to reveal. That is what Jesus came to reveal. So when you look at the scriptures in chapter one of the book of John, that says no one, no one had seen God at any time. But he says, but the only begotten of the father, who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has declared him. That is what you see, you know, that is what you see played out. You see, in the person of Jesus, all right, from the time that he was born to the time that he went to the cross, you see, died, was made sin, went to hell, you see, was justified, conquered Satan, fully atoned for sin, was raised from the dead, then was raised from the grave, then ascended. You see, it was all about this. It was all about awakening, awakening the consciousness of man to the true substance, the true nature, the true character, the true essence, tangible essence of the person of God. Now, this is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why, you know, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the unveilings of truth that a person begins to become exposed to, you see, after this um, initial, you know, awakening, you know, to this divine you know, manifestation of the person and the love of God, you know, at new birth, you know, is referred to as a um, foundation. I'll call it foundational truth. You see, it's not foundational because it is insignificant. It is foundational because upon it, upon that revelation, rest every other, every other operation of God, every other manifestation of the person of the realities and dimensions that exist in God, in Christ Jesus. So when you hear the apostle Peter, all right, saying that as newborn babes, as newborn babes, he says we are to desire this sincere milk of the world. The word sincere means unadulterated, all right, free, free of contamination, free of contamination. He said, we have to desire this sincere milk of the word. This sincere milk of the word. By which we are to grow thereby. This sincere milk. So the word milk, you know, is not suggestive of insignificant, irrelevant. You know, some people would, you know, interpret it from the, from the, you know, human limitation. You know, language human, you know, the la la rather the la la limitation of, of the human language. You know, but the word milk is used as a parable, is used as a parabolic reference. A, as a parable, a parable reference, all right, to, you know, um, the spiritual significance, the spiritual significance, you see, of this foundational truth. the spiritual significance of this foundational truth. They are not foundational, meaning insignificant, no. Meaning irrelevant, no. Like I, 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 I say often, it is one of the reasons, you see, why, you know, um, um, a believer, you see certain believers get a certain point of their journeys, 10 years of being saved, 20 years of being saved, all right? 
and is suddenly confused, you see, about, you know, how to hear God, suddenly uncertain about how God speaks, about how he is to hear God, suddenly not sure about how to discern, how to receive divine leadings. So you see, like we had highlighted in the, you know, um, in the last session, that this understanding, this this revelation of the goodness of God. That, that's another word for encapsulating it all. That revelation of the goodness of God. You see, of his the character, revelation of his character, his person, his nature. You see which can be summed up as his goodness or his love, all right, is the first basis, all right, the first basis, you see, for mastering. The understanding of it is the first basis for mastering supernatural leaders. Is the first basis for supernatural leaders. Now, the second, you know, the second thing we had highlighted, all right, is we touched on that or mentioned it, referenced it, you know, um, um, in the last session, all right, is the spiritual design, the, 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 the design of man, you know, I want to, now, for the sake of um, um, coming across as, um, possibly um, um, as simple, you know, as possible at, as it can be, all right, is the reason why, you know, um, I will be deliberately not using certain words. You understand? Is the reason why, you know, I'll be deliberately not using certain words and I'll be deliberately using certain words. You see, So we said the second, you know, um, trigger, all right, for, you know, uh, um, uh, um, mastering divine supernatural leadings, all right, is man's design, man's architectural design, man, how man is designed, how man was designed by God, you see, which brings to, which, you know, brings to light the, the, the 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 senses of man or what we you know to refer to as the ah, gate. Well. How about as the gate of man the senses the senses notice I'm saying I prefer to use what senses than to say spiritual senses you would get to find out in the course of this teaching you see because you see every of man's senses every of man's senses were originally all right created to be spiritual, every of man's senses. Now, when we say senses, we mean the senses of his body, all right, the senses of his, you know, soul and spirit, his senses, they are spiritual. You know, when you say spiritual senses, when you say spiritual senses, or you say spiritual antenna, you see, there is a way it tends to throw people off guard. People immediately begin to look for it. They begin to look for it. They don't want to, where, where are my spiritual senses? In fact, some people have come up with all kinds of phrases, like, you know, your sixth sense, you know, your inner eyes. You, you understand that? So people are wondering, you know, where, where are my inner eyes? Where are they located? You see, there is no true understanding. You see, a true understanding, all right, of your spiritual senses, in quote, a true understanding of your spiritual senses cannot, you know, be hard. All right, if the subject of man's, you know, structural spiritual design is not understood. You see, it is one of the reasons why a lot of people don't even know when God, 
all right, in court, they don't even know when God has spoken to them. Because you see, when God speaks, listen carefully, listen, I, 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 I would to God and I trust God that this teaching series will revolutionize your, your life, will revolutionize your understanding of supernatural leadings. So please, don't get uneasy. Don't get, you know, you know, um, uncomfortable if we say certain things or in sharing we say certain things that debunks or contradicts what you probably have been taught about supernatural leadings. You see, over the years, from the things that the Lord has shown me over the years, I have come to see, amongst other things, that you cannot truly understand. You can have a proper, robust, or should I say comprehensive understanding, all right, of the spiritual, of the spiritual, all right, if the structural design of man is not understood. And that is one of the reasons why many things that we have taught in the body of Christ, all right, on different subjects of, you know, the Bible, all right, have um have not been um you know robust now just just be patient with me you understand as we you will see what i'm trying to say as we go on as we go on all right as, now one of the things i remember we mentioned last um in the last you know episode in the last series in the last yes episode is the fact that um god we said that God, you know, there's this popular, you know, conception, all right, which I, you know, have referred to as a misconception, you know, that God, you know, leads in different ways. God leads different ways, or you call it the different ways that God speaks. The different ways that God speaks, you know, you think about it. The different ways that God speaks. No, what are the different ways that God speaks? So we say, okay, God speaks through the inward witness. No, you are the one hearing God through the inward witness. It is not God speaking through the inward witness. It's okay. Another way that God speaks is through visions. All right. Then you break down visions. You have what? Vivid vision, open vision. You have inward. No, you are the one experiencing God through visions. See, listen carefully. Now, I use a natural, you know, illustration that can easily be tossed aside, you know, in the last session, you know, about um, the senses of your body the sense of your body. I said, for example, God has given you the senses that you boast of, that you boast that your body has. The sense of sight, the sense of hearing, sense of smell, touch, all right? All of that, you know, the five senses, basically, of your body. Now, when you use these senses, can you say it is God using the senses for you? No. The use of your senses, all right? The use of your senses are at your prerogative. You see, the use of your senses, the use of your body senses are at your prerogative. Now, you must understand it is much the same with the senses, you see, of your soul and your spirit. God does not use, will not use your spirit senses for you. It's yours. It's yours. That is one of the reasons, actually, you will see such scriptures as the book of Revelation chapter 2, all right, where repeatedly, all right, the church is said, all right, or the church is told or spoken to, all right, where you see the statement that says, um, let him that hears, let him that hears, let him that hears what the Spirit said to the church. Or let him that has ear, rather, the King James says, let him that has ear hear. You see, let him that has ear hear. Now, what, what does that suggest? It suggests, all right, the fact that the exercise of our senses, the exercise of our senses, all right, 
are subject to us. They are, you know, subject to our exercise. You see, another such scripture is chapter five of the book of Hebrews. You see, the last verse there says, strong meat belongs to them who are of age and who by reason of use have their senses exercised. Who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Have their senses, have their senses exercised. So just, I want to beg you to stay true, all right, all this, through this series. It, it will help you. So you wonder, okay, why do certain persons, you know, have visions? Why do they have, you know, visionary experience, you see, of the word of the Lord? Why do certain persons, all right, tend to be more led by intuitions? You see, why do certain persons tend to be more led by, by inward impressions? We are going to break this down because it will help you to see that all these different ways are functions of your different senses. You see, functions of your different senses, all right, that when properly understood and harnessed, you see, can be exercised in experiencing the word or the voice of God. So no one is peculiarly and specially, particularly blessed, you know, with visions. No one is specially blessed, you see, as it were, with intuitions, no such things. So we'll come back again. It's important that the structure of man is understood. It's important that the structure, now in the course of this teaching, all right, um, um, from time to time, we will put up a diagram, all right, of um, what we may call the the senses of man, all right, all right, the senses of man, you know, that's simple enough. And for those who don't have issues with words, all right, we also refer to it as the gates or the gateways of man, all right, the gateways of man or the senses, the senses, all right, I don't want to say spiritual senses, all right. We've talked about the fact that man, 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 man is spirit, soul, body, you see, Man is spirit, soul, body, all right? Man is spirit, soul, body, all right? Man is not, as it were, a spirit that has a soul, lives in a body. No, man is spirit, soul, body. There is no, there is no, you know, true understanding of man. You see, if one aspect of man, all right, is absent, you see, it is one of the reasons, it is one of the reasons why in the redemption, all right, in the redemption, all right, the redemption of the body, all right, is in that package of salvation. The redemption, the what we may also call the immortalization, the immortality of the body. You see, the immortality of the body. You see, because you see, without man's body, man is not complete. And it is not as though man lives in the body. No, man does not live in the body. That is not God's original design. Now, in the course of this situation, we're going to put up, you know, diagrams, you know, to help us have some kind of mental graphic, you know, you know, imagery of pictures. All right, imagery of pictures. You see, that is when you look at Jesus. Jesus, after his resurrection. Don't forget, he came into this world as man, all right? Died as man, went to hell as man, was justified as man, all right? And was raised and ascended as man. And now retains, retains, you see, retains as it were his manhood, while at the same time retains his what? His godhood. So Jesus, all right, is now both 100% God and 100% man. But if you look at his, you know, his, his estate 
as 100% man. You see, his body is retained. Remember when after his ascension, resurrection and ascension, when he stood before his disciples, when he suddenly appeared before the disciples, he told them to touch him, to feel him. In fact, he said to Thomas to put his hand through the holes. You see, in his hands, put the holes in his side. Then he goes on to say, he said, for spirits do not have flesh and bones. He said, spirit don't have flesh. Ghost, that's what he meant to say, ghost. Ghost don't have flesh and bones. As he does, We're going to touch on that later. So, you know, what he meant by spirit or ghost was the context of the use of that word spirit. Okay. So, you see, Jesus said, he said, feel me. Feel me. So, you see, in his, in his resurrection or after his resurrection and ascension, all right, all right, he is spirit, soul, body. You see, because that is God's original architectural design. You see, when he was raised, all right, he was raised with a body. You see, he wasn't raised disembodied. He was raised with a body. The reason is because according to God's original architectural design for man, Man is spirit, soul, body. Man is spirit, soul, body. That is why according to the scripture, every saint, all right, every saint who leaves the earth and, you know, checks out of this sphere, checks out of this sphere, all right, by physical death, all right, will eventually pick up, they will eventually pick up their body. But like the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, not as it was sown in corruption, but what? Say that body will be raised in incorruption. Because see, without that body, man is not complete. It's because the body is part of man's architectural design. It is part of man's architectural design. So man is spirit. Man is not a spirit. No, it's because that is how we've come to know it, that man is a spirit, has a soul, lives in a body. No. No. Now, we've said that, all right, we've said that, you know, at, you know, a basic foundational level to help people, you know, grasp it, you know, but as they, as, as believers, you know, mature and come into greater understanding, all right, it becomes imperative that, you see, the true shape, the true design of man, amongst other things, must be communicated, must be understood, must be, must be grasped, must be fathomed, all right? If true, authentic, spiritual kingdom, divine function is to be experienced by any believer, So when you look at when you look at man's structural design, all right, he's got senses, all right, or what we call gates. He's got he's got gates, all right, gates in his body, soul, and spirit, or what we call the gates of his body and the gates of his heart. Now, throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, we see men whom we categorize or qualify as spiritual. Spiritual men. Now we call them spiritual men because, all right, they had some level of graphs, of varying degrees of graphs, you see, of, you know, the spiritual function. You see, spiritual function of their senses, which they in turn leveraged on to navigate, to interact with the realities of God with the realities of the kingdom of God around them. You see, from the very first man, even after his fall, after the fall of Adam, 
after Adam's fall, we have the track records of different men who leveraged on that understanding, that understanding, all right, of the function of their senses to interact and transverse spiritual realities. Which was the reason why they could hear God, they could speak to God, they could relate, they could administer the things of God, even in spite of their, you know, fallen state, in, in spite of the dispensation that they lived in. You see, such men as Noah heard God speak to them, such men as Enoch, the Bible says he walked with God and was not. You see, and was not. Such men as Abraham. What about such men as Job? Look at the story of Job. Look at the kinds of friends Job had. Spiritual men. All right? Spiritually minded men. Look at these three friends. Look at Elihu. Look at, look at, in their conversation recorded in the book of Job, all right, look at the weight of the understanding of the spiritual that this man had. It reflected in their conversations. You see, you go and you read the men in Judges, the Judges, in the book of Judges. Look at someone like Samson saying, he said, I will go out and shake myself as at other times. Of course, we understand that that shaking of himself is not physical dancing. He wasn't giggling, you know, he wasn't dancing. He wasn't, you know, no. Shake myself as at other times, all right, is a parable, all right, is a parabolic description, you see, of how Samson, all right, would condition, would arouse himself, condition himself, which in turn brings him under the direct tangible influence of the spirit of mind, all right, which causes him in a moment, in a moment to go from being one ordinary person to a superhuman person. This man understood spiritual things. Same goes for David. When you read many of the Psalms that David and you know some of the other guys wrote, if you listen to some of the things they said, you will see the depth, the, 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 the wealth, treasures in many things they said, all right, depicting, all right, their understanding, or rather reflecting their understanding of spiritual things, spiritual ways, spiritual functions. It's one of the reasons why I usually say that how these men walked with God wasn't, you know, as some believers, you know, you know, um, um, have falsely come to believe that it was just something that was given to them on a platter of gold. No. If you look at the lives of many of these people, you will see that all right, there was a degree of understanding that they had, all right, of, of, the, of the spiritual that in turn gave them leverage, gave them leverage, gave them leverage as it were above every other person. So it doesn't as though God just, you know, specially selected one person and made the person special from the rest. If you study carefully, there were certain disciplines that gave them leverage. Certain disciplines. One of which is this man, all right, this man understood. They understood the spiritual function of their senses. And they harnessed it. They understood the spiritual function of their senses. You see, and they harnessed it. 
They have nested. They were disciplined to harness, to harness. When they came into the, you know, realization, all right, of, of you know, one or more, you know, functions of their, of their, of their senses, all right, they took the time, spent the time to harness it, to cultivate it as it were. They were not lazy men. Particularly when you look at the folks in the Old Testament portion, portion of the Bible, they were in lazy people. They were in lazy people. They were disciplined people. Disciplined people. At least to the degree, all right, which gave them, which gave them leverage. You see, for example, you see the scripture talking about somebody like Isaac in 24 Genesis 63, that he went. Now, it wasn't just a one-time thing. It was Isaac's practice. Scripture there says he went into the field to meditate. Now, first of, first of all, whom do you think he learned that from? His father. His father. He learned that from Abraham. So Isaac, all right, not must have. Isaac actually grew up observing Abraham, practicing the art of meditation. One such example, even though the word meditation, all right, even though the word meditation is not used, all right, is what you see in chapter 18 of the book of Genesis. When it says that the Bible, you know, the, or rather when the scripture says in chapter 18 of Genesis, that it says in verse 1, it says, and the Lord appeared unto Moses, sorry, unto Abraham, all right, in Mamre, you see, then he goes on to describe or to say that Abraham, all right, sat in the door of his tent in the heat of the day. All right, then he lifted up his eyes and behold, three men stood before him. You read that scripture, it's a parable. So it's not just that Abraham was just sitting down, you know, just thinking about his life, then just looked and saw three people standing there. From the, from the first verse of that chapter, all right, to when he saw these men, to when he ran to these three men and bowed to one of them and says, my Lord, singular. But there were three men. All of this goes to describe the spiritual intelligence of this man, which was, or which is largely a function of the knowledge of his senses that he had unnessed which he had committed himself to cultivating. Isaac grew up seeing this. So when Isaac made it a practice to always go to the field to meditate, you see, it wasn't just a random thing. It was a discipline that he had imbibed, you see, from watching Observing his father, observing his father. You see, or you look at um, look at Job. Look at Job. When you look at the 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 the, the first introduction of Job. You know, before they, you know, attack, they are sought, you know, from Satan. Those are sought came from Satan, not from God. All right. Now, those attacks that came, before the attacks rather came, if you look at the description of Job, his person, his, you know, his pedigree, his status, his stature, you see, you see one thing stands out. One thing is the foundation upon which every other thing, all right, is built. It is the spirituality of that man. Job was a spiritual man in that, you see, he understood the function of his spiritual senses and harnessed it. You see, you must understand that what the scripture says, all right, or what the scripture means when it says that the man was, you know, upright. No one was as upright as that man in all the, that means in the whole of that region. 
You see, that statement is huge. It's huge. It's, it's big. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. You see, because you will see that eventually when those attacks came, when those assaults came heavily on Job, you see, when it came on Job, you see, one of the reasons why Job couldn't curse God, you know, when he was asked to curse God, you see, one of them that helped him to not curse God, you see, is the fact that leveraging on the exercise of his senses, this man had tasted God. You understand that? It takes a man who has tasted the spirituals, who has tasted it. It takes a man who has tasted the spiritual, all right, to not, all right, speak disdainly or scornfully or blasphemously about the spiritual. You see the same thing, for example, in the church today. When people see an authentic spiritual operation, they call it false. You see? Now, that just goes to show you that is either this individual, all right, all right, is not having a practical functional interaction with the spiritual himself, all right, or he's having spiritual interaction, but at a level, all right, at a level below, yes, at a level below the spiritual interaction manifesting that he's seen. You see, because you see, the knowledge, the knowledge of the spiritual is not mental. It's not a mental thing. You see, the knowledge of spirituals is not a mental intellectual acquisition of facts and information. The knowledge, all right, of the spiritual, the knowledge of the spiritual is a function of, you know, practical experience. It is experiential. That is something most understand about the spiritual. You see, knowledge in the spirit is a function of experience, is a function of experience. All right, experiencing realities, all right, through your senses. That is how knowledge is gained in the spirit. You see, it's similar, it's similar to how knowledge of natural things are gained. All right, you know, on a very basic level, you understand how knowledge in the natural is gained. You, you interact with things, with your senses. That is how you come to have knowledge of things. That is how you come to have knowledge of things. Now, we understand that in between that, there is what is, there is, what is called theoretical knowledge, where you gain knowledge from reading, reading books about things. You read, you gather information about things that you've never experienced. You just read, gather facts, facts you never personally, you see, researched upon. So it is facts, all right, that is based on someone else's research. There's that, we call it theoretical knowledge. But the basic way that man is designed to gain knowledge, all right, first on the level of what? The body, all right, is through his five senses. The things that you can see, the things you can feel, the things you can hear, the things you can perceive, the things you can taste, all right? It is a reason why we call them gates. They are the gates through which you see, information through which the reality of things, through which existence, all right? The knowledge of existence is realized. Now, the same goes for your heart. The same goes for your heart. You see, your heart never really knows anything, all right? that it does not experience. Your spirit never really knows anything. You see? Your spirit never really knows anything that it does not experience. That is how you are designed. That is how you are designed. That is the reason why, you see, after your natural birth, 
all right, after your natural birth, all right, it is through your spiritual birth, all right, on the account of which you gain consciousness to God, you become awakened to God, all right, that your spirit, your spirit, all right, by coming alive to God, comes into a vital experience. So what we call the new birth, the new birth is actually you experiencing God. You come into an experience, all right? You come into an experience of the life of God. You come into the, an experience of the love of God. You see, through the communication of the revelation of God's love, which is called the gospel, all right, you are awakened. So the new birth is an actual experience. It's man's actual experience of God. The new bed is not just a crusade thing. The new bed is not just you watching a television, te a tele it's an actual experience. All right? It's an actual experience. Your spirit come into an actual experience of divine life. It's an actual knowledge. You come into an actual knowledge. An actual knowledge of the fatherhood of God. This is how God designed man. This is how man is designed. So what man is the reason why I usually say, what man, what man cannot experience? He cannot know. You, you are born to experience. You are born to experience you are born that's how you that's how you were designed to know things you see you are born to experience realities to have a knowledge of realities so it is by experiencing realities that you gain knowledge revelation knowledge of realities so what you see that is obtainable with your you know what okay all right, <laughs> let me use these words. What you refer to as your physical senses, your physical senses. Now, we're going to touch on that much later in this teaching. We've done that in some series. All right, explain the word physical. All right, explain the word physical. The word physical basically means susceptible to the senses. All right, the word physical basically means what is susceptible to your senses. And your senses are not only eyes, ear, nose, mouth. No, 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 no. Your heart has senses. Your spirit has senses. So whatsoever is susceptible to your senses is physical. To the degree to which it is susceptible to you, it is physical. Physical is because of you can touch it, you can relate with it. So if you can touch and relate with it, all right, in your heart, in the same way that you can touch and relate with things with your body, it is physical to you. Don't worry about that now. We'll come back to that later. Yeah, glory to God. Jesus said the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is within you. Glory to God. Glory to Jesus. All right. Now, so you see, that's how man is designed, your senses. So that's why you look at the scriptures. You will see that when you study the scriptures closely, and we're going to look at some of them in the course of this teaching. All right. When you look at the scriptures closely, in relation to, you know, how different people, all right, in different places in the Bible, in the scriptures, all right, were led, were guided, received directions, received them, um, you know, divine knowledge, all right, you would see that it was never at any time, excuse me, it was never at any time without, it was never at any time without the exercise, without the exercise of their senses. Never at any time. See, because that is how God has designed man. And that is how God, God is committed. Having designed man that way, God is committed to reaching you through your senses. Yes. Listen carefully. God is committed to reaching you through your senses. Now, when we say senses, we are talking about what? The senses of your spiritual body. You see, 
the senses of your spirit soul body. Designed you that way. You see? Now listen, folks. It is the reason why the devil can speak to you. I'm sure you know the devil speaks to everyone. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how believers find it difficult or, or believers think it's very difficult to hear God, but they don't believe it's difficult to hear the devil. Believers are constantly hearing Satan. He speaks, Satan is speaking to people, speaking to believers. Thoughts, ideas, you see, <laughs> speaking. So believers don't have a difficult time believing that Satan can speak to them. But they have a very difficult time believing and accepting that God can speak to them. So you have believers who are more in doubt. They are more in doubt about their ability to hear God than they are about their ability to hear Satan. How, 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 how amazing. Believers who are more in doubt, they are more in doubt about their ability to hear God than they are about their ability to hear demons. You see, the reason why Satan can speak to you, Satan can, he's, look at the first, look at Adam in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Satan came to them, now he's called the serpent, now of course, we dealt with that, the serpent is not one snake crawling from across one tree, that's crap, pure religious crap, there was no such thing, the word serpent is used, all right, to describe the nature, the nature, it's the nature, not the form, not the shape and form of this being, all right, it's the nature of this being that was being referred to as serpent. So it was not a snake, it's not a dragon, you know, coily looking, you know, stuff, you know, hanging from across a tree that was talking to them. All right, we'll get to that in previous teaching. Just in case you're interested, you can, all right, show your interest. We'll send the messages to you. Exhausting, very exhausting, very, very exhausting. All right, I guarantee you that. <laughs> you know, so now notice. They were where God had placed them. They were in this civilization of, of, of divine energy. That was what Eden. That is the Eden the Bible spoke of. You see, that, that Eden, that garden in the east of Eden, that garden itself too is a parable. That garden is a parable. It's not a garden full of flowers. You know, you know flowers and trees. It's a parable. You see, but the summary of what that garden is, all right, is a, div a place of divine civilization. You see, where man, all right, where man was placed by God, man was placed there not to become a farmer. He was placed there, all right, you know, to be given an opportunity. You see, he, man's experience in that place, all right, his experiences rather in that place where and most of that is targeted at unlocking him. Do you understand? At, you know, escal causing an escalation of his full potential. You see, man, from the time that he was created and formed, did not immediately come to the, you know, realization of his fullest potential. You see, that was the reason why in the first place, they were subject to temptation. Do you understand that? They were subject to temptation. Satan could tempt them. Satan could tempt them. That man that was created and formed, when I mean that man, I be both Adam and Eve. All right? Both of them were man. That's what the Bible tells us. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, God said, let us make man, not man, not man and woman, in our own image and after likeness. You see? Then the following verse says, and God created man. And God created man. It is that God created man and woman. It's and God created man in his own image, male and female, not man and woman. In other words, both of them were called what? Man. You see? Both of them were called what? Man. They were both man. <laughs> Glory to God. In other words, all right, subject to original divine structural architectural design. You see? 
Eve wasn't less a man than Adam. You see, but Eve's, you know, but her being female and is being male, all right, is subject to function and responsibility, but subject to structural architectural design. They were both man. No one was less or more than the other. All right, subject to architectural structural design. So when the Bible, Paul acknowledges that in First Corinthians 15, First Corinthians 15, 45, he said the first man, all right, was made a living soul. That spoke of both of them. That spoke of that creation. That creation called Adam and Eve is what Paul calls the first man. That first man, subject to the structure of life that they were given to leave it. All right? Paul says it is living soul. Now, the phrase living soul is not just the soul. It's not suke as used in the, in the Greek. All right? It was a word that, you know, there was no better word to use to describe the, to capture the architecture of life. So when it goes on in that same verse for the vibe, that the last Adam or the last man, all right, was made a life-giving spirit. King James translation was made a life-giving spirit. Now, that life-giving spirit is a description for the structure and, you know, an architecture of life as Jesus now has it and as everyone in Christ now has it. You see? So, Genesis 3, so when Satan came to them, you see, when Satan came to them, he spoke to them. They had Satan. They had Satan. Now, if you, now, I, I think at this point, I would love to reference this, uh, say this. All right. If you're hearing this for the first time, I want to implore you, go get the teachings we have done where this, all right, where we cover this, you know, we cover this, you know, intensively, you know, exhaustively. We covered it, you know, real hard. We hit it real hard. You understand? It will help you. It will help you. Now, the, 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 it's, it's, it's the, 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 the teaching series, when we cover this, and I have different, you know, title or something. So you just indicate your interest and we'll send you the link where you can get them. Go and listen to them. Go and listen to them. You know, it will help you. It will help you. Because in one of those series, we talked about the fact that the serpent, all right, that's this personality, not a snake. This personality did not come to meet them in Eden. He didn't come to meet them in Eden. You see, this individual didn't come to meet them in Eden because by nature, all right, by nature, all right, of what this individual currently was, this individual, individual this, this being called the serpent, by virtue of what he currently was, all right, all right, by virtue of what he currently was, according to nature, according to his nature, all right, he couldn't have been able to assess Eden. You see? Because, see, access to Eden is by nature. Do you understand that? So it's not that maybe there's a door to enter through. So when you read 4 and chapter 3, and the Bible tells you that after that man was sent out, how was man sent out? There was no door out of Eden. Man stepped out of Eden through his nature. So when the scripture says that, and God placed a cherub and a flaming sword that turned in every direction to keep the way to the tree of life. Oh, I feel like teaching on this right now. <laughs> but we've, we've touched on this in some, in some teachings, but you know, there's another aspect to it, you know, moving from that, which is in future meetings. But you see, what I wanted to say here is Satan's, Satan wasn't able to come to them in Eden. He didn't even come there. He couldn't come there. By nature, couldn't have come there. All right? Couldn't have come there. You see? But so someone is wondering, so if, 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 if he couldn't have come in there, so how did he speak to them? Get the teachings. 
But the reason why we're referencing this is this, 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 this man, this man was, he was, he was, you know, he was something, you see? He was according to his, you know, his design, his structural architectural design, all right? Within, according to his structural architectural design, all right, there was a, there was a capacity, there was an ability within him to be able to speak with Satan, you see? Across dimensions. Satan actually, Satan actually spoke to them. Satan spoke to them from across dimensions, you see? But this man before the fall existed in a state, in a height of civilization, you see, that enabled them to transverse across dimensions. You see, because the distances between two or more dimensions, all right, is bridged. The distances between two or more dimensions rather are bridged in the heart. They are bridged in the heart. So when the scripture tells you that eternity is in the heart of men, eternity there is not just longevity. It's not long length. You see, it's not just length. You see, the word eternity is used to capture, all right, is used to capture the structure, to capture both the structure of man, you see, all right, in relation to the structure of the world around him. When I mean the world, I don't just mean this planet. I don't just mean this, this world over which Satan is God, all right, that's this, you know, corrupt, fallen, broken world, all right. I mean, eternity, that's the world's. The words, in fact, that is one of the words that is used to interpret the word eternity in that book of Ecclesiastes. When he says he has put eternity in the hearts of men, it is words, words. So the distances across words, the distances across words are bridged with in the heart of man. Oh, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, so in Genesis 3, Satan, that was the person, not a serpent looking thing, all right? So I know some people are having questions. Don't worry, go get the teachings. Just in case I want to look, if it's not a serpent, all right, in, you know, verses after that, why did God say you will crawl? Go get the message. Why did God say you will crawl upon your belly and dust you shall eat? Go get the message. Get it and listen to it. You'll be blessed. So, but you see, Satan spoke to them. Satan spoke to them. See, they heard Satan speak. They heard, listen, they heard Satan speak, all right, with the same gates with which, all right, they heard God speak. Because it was with the gates, they fellowship with God. With their gates, they fellowship with God. They were having fellowship with God, you see, in that, in that you know, civilization state called Eden. It's not a garden of all kinds of beautiful trees. It doesn't matter how you want to represent it. It was not a garden of leaves and trees and flowers. You see, it's a parable, you see, of an estate of civilization. So in that estate, all right, they had fellowship with God. They had interactions with the realities of God, all right, with the use of their senses, with the use of their gates. Now, with the same senses at all gates, all right, they were able to speak with the serpent. They were able to speak with Satan. Now, it doesn't end there. Now, throughout scripture, even after that man had fallen, throughout scripture, you will see Satan speak to people. You will see demons, evil spirits speak to people, influence people's thoughts, all right? People will, you know, come under demonic influences, all right? Come under demonic inspiration and act accordingly. And act accordingly. The same way in scriptures, you will see people come under the influence of God the divine influence of God, and act accordingly. How 
are all of this possible? Through the gate or through the senses of man. Through the senses of man. Through the senses of man. You see? And the scripture says, don't forget that scripture, Hebrews 5, it says, strongly belong to those who are of age and who by reason of use have their senses, have their senses exercised. You see? Have their senses exercised. So the exercise of your senses, all right? There is the exercise, all right, of one or more of your senses, all right? There is the exercise of multiple senses. And you see, how much, all right, of your senses you're able to exercise, all right, go a long way in determining, you see, how much of God you will experience or how you are able to experience God or how the word of God, how the revelation of God, all right, comes across to you. You see, Jesus quoting Moses, all right, Moses had said that, and Jesus said that, all right, in his temptation, you know, uh, um, um, you know, in his, you know, standoff, I prefer to put his standoff, you know, against Satan. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now you must understand that. So he speaks of the word that proceeds. Now the Greek, all right, uses the word rema as against the word for logos, rema. So it says man lives by the word that proceeds. So the communication of God, the communication of God to man, all right, comes across to you as rema. You see, but how you experience that rema, that proceeding word. See, the proceeding word is not just teaching. He's telling you how God deals with man. Because Moses called that scripture in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, man lives by every word that proceeds. Every word that proceeds. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So God speaks. So what God says, all right, is what scripture refers to as what? The word that proceeds. You see, now, that word that proceeds from God, all right, on entering through your gates, that word proceeding from God on impact with your senses is what informs how you experience God, is what informs, you know, whether it's the visionary experience, is what informs whether it's the intuitive experience, is what, that is what informs that, depending on what gates of your heart, all right, depending on what gate of your heart, that that word impacts upon. And listen, folks, you have a lot to do, all right, with what gates or gates, all right, you experience the proceeding word. You have a lot to do. Maybe you've never heard this before. You're hearing this now, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to, we are looking at it from scriptures. You have a lot to do. All right, with what gates or gates? You have a lot to do with, let me put it differently. You have a lot to do with how many gates? How many gates, all right, with which you receive the proceeding word, which in turn go a long way in determining what the nature of the experience will be like. You see, so there's really nothing like God spoke to you through a vision. No, God spoke you. All right, for some reasons, which I'm going to explain, for certain factors, due to certain factors, which I'm going to explain later. All right, you are the one who experienced God. You are the one. All right, you are the one that on impact, experience God in a vision. You see? Because like I said earlier, when God speaks to you, he does not use your gate for you. He doesn't use your gate for you. So there are certain gate combination, as it were, all right, relax, I'm using human words. There are certain gate combination, 
all right, with which you hear the word of God, all right, that results into visions. You see, there are certain gates combination with which you receive the proceeding word that translates as impression, that translates as inward knowing. Do you see? There are certain gates combination, all right, with which you receive the proceeding word of God, all right, that translates, you see, as a strong knowing, all right, as a deep insight, deep insight. Say, listen, folks, these are functions. First and foremost, these are functions, all right, of your gates, your senses. They are not primarily functions of gifts. They are not gifts. There's no such as gift of vision. Now, yes, yes, I know some. Yeah, question. We are going to explain. Okay, why do certain persons, all right, experience God visionarily, which in turn is the result of what they are referred to as what seers? We're going to explain that. We're going to explain that. All right. These experiences of the word of the Lord that are primarily functions of gifts. We're going to explain that in this series. So it's a long ride. It's a long ride, all right? It's a long ride that will lead to, you know, that will bring about huge transformation. Huge transformation. I'm telling you. See, there is nothing. I, you see, I, I, love, I love to teach kingdom things because see, there is nothing complex. Nothing complex about anything about God. Nothing complex. Nothing complex. Nothing. 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 That is one of the proof, all right, of the simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel. Not the word simplicity doesn't mean trivial, doesn't not simple trivial. No, 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 no. The word simplicity that is used by Paul, all right, is not a depiction of what insignificant or, or small. No. 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 So I, 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 I want to guarantee you, this will change your life. Stay through this series. You may want to call it a course. Stay through the course. You want to call it an academy on hearing God. Stay through it. Have you been hearing God? Yes, stay through it. Your hearing God can improve. You can improve on it. I can, I can guarantee you, it will improve. It will blow up to a whole new level. When you come to learn, the basic what we are explaining, and we go further. That oh, really? So you mean I have a lot to do with how rich my hearing God can become? How rich? Oh, glory to God! Glory to God! Glory, glory to Jesus forever! Glory, glory, glory. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You see, in the Old Testament, you know, portion of the Bible, all right, I'd rather say in the scriptures, you will hear the prophet say, and the word of the Lord came to me. You see, and the word of the Lord came to me. And when you read, you will see where they would say the word of the Lord came to me and they were caught up into visions. Meanwhile, some other times they would say the word of the Lord came to me. All right. And they would just what? They would just have an intuitive revelation. And in, that's some kind of download. And other times they would say the word of the Lord came to me and they would hear God saying to them, without in quote necessarily seeing anything. Or you hear the prophet say, and the hand of the Lord came upon me and I was in the visions of God. We are going to explain all of this. You see?
you see. But it's important that you have a grip of this foundation we are laying. No rush in this series, all right? No rush. It's important that you have a grip of this foundation we're laying, all right? On, for example, your gates, your senses. Think, see, give it some thought. Give it some, spend some days to think about it. The fact that what? All right, you have senses. You have senses, all right, across your being as much as you do or just like you do in your body. You have senses. You see, you have senses in your heart just like you do in your body. You have senses. You have senses. You see, and your senses across your being, your senses across your being, spirit, soul, body, all right? Spirit, soul, body, all right? Are God's way of communicating with you. They are your way of communicating with God. You see, your senses, spirit, soul, body, all right, are God's way of getting across to you. They are your own way, all right, of getting across to God, your senses, your senses. You see, your senses. You see, and one last thing I love to highlight, just, you know, put keep this in, is in relation to the senses, you will realize that the more exercised your senses become, the more exercised your senses become, all right, with an end to having a reaching um, and enriched, you know, and rewarding, you know, communion with God, the more sensitive, the more aware also you will be of demons, of Satan. Now, 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 relax. I'm not saying this to induce fear. No, no, no. Because, see, listen, listen, listen. It's, it cuts across. You see, the more cultivated your senses become, because when you cultivate your senses, when you, you know, go through the process of, as it were, developing your senses, all right, of course, with an end to having an enriching, you know, communion with God, you must understand that that will also translate into coming into a greater awareness of the world around you, the worlds around you, all right? Okay, let me use a layman's language. For me, it's a layman's language, all right? Let me use a layman's language. Now, I'll repeat that again. Now, the more cultivated and developed, all right, your spiritual senses to God become, all right, the more spiritually aware you will become of the spiritual realm, all right? It's a layman language, spiritual realm. It's a layman language. Listen to some of the teachings we've done. You will understand why I said that. But you get the point. You see, the more spiritually aware through the cultivation of your spiritual senses, all right, the more spiritually aware you become to God, all right, the more spiritually aware you will become of the spiritual realm, the more discerning of demons you become. Oh, yes. Because the the greater, let me put it this way, the greater your ability to hear God, which is a function of what? The cultivation of your senses, all right? The more easily you'll be able to hear Satan. And it, it doesn't cause for fear. It just means that the more aware you will be of the spiritual realm, both light and darkness. And listen, folks, it is fun. It is fun. It is fun. Take, for example, the Bible tells you, the scripture tells you, all right, in chapter 4 of Luke and of Matthew, that after Jesus was baptized, all right, after Jesus was baptized by John, all right, after what, John, like John said, all right, the Holy Ghost had come upon him, all right, he said the Spirit of God drove him, all right, drove him. The other one says the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. The devil came to Jesus, and Jesus saw the devil. Jesus saw Satan. So when you talk about, you know, sin, don't say God forbid. God forbid what? <laughs> God forbid what? God forbid that what? Because you see, let me tell you about this. Whether you see demons or not, de demons are around you. They are constantly talking to you. 
Many of those thoughts that comes into in court, your head, you think it's coming to your head. Those thoughts coming to your heart actually are demons having conversations with you. Is the reason why lots of believers cannot distinguish between their own thoughts, they cannot distinguish their own thoughts from demons' thoughts, thoughts from demons. Is the reason many believers live, live confused life. They think every thought that comes to their heart is their own thoughts. No. No. Some of the thoughts that as a believer you experience is a demon talking to you. Just that you're not hearing a voice. Just that you're probably not seeing a form. Is a demon talking to you. If you understand this, we've done that, he talked about that in one previous teaching. It will help you to not struggle with every thought. It will help you to handle thoughts. You see, particularly in explain this some series, you know, about particularly when it comes to you know telling your thought from Satan's thought. For example, your own thought can be silenced. You can silence your own thought because it's your thought. Once you shut your heart from thinking that thought, all right, the thought goes numb. You see, but when in an attempt to shut the thought, the thought is not shutting down. It is because it is not your thought. You know, there are times, you know, when in court, you are thinking something, all right? Because you are the one thinking it, you can stop thinking it, right? And the thought just goes, just, you know, pops. But there are some other times when believers think they are the one thinking the thought. And in a bit to shut the thought, the thought is not shutting down. That is enough clue to you that what? That's not your thought. You are dealing with a spirit. In such moment, don't say, I forbid this thought. That's why the thought keeps coming. You see, you don't. <laughs> it's a spirit talking to you. In such moment, you'd address the spirit. That is the time to talk to a divine intelligence. You talk to a spiritually intelligent person, a spiritually intelligent being. Behind that thought, you say, get, get out. Not get out to the thought, but get out to the being. See, not understanding this is the reason many believers have struggled with thoughts. Struggle with thoughts. See, I don't know. The thought keeps coming. The thought, my friend, it's not your thoughts. It's not your own. Particularly when you're dealing with demonic thoughts, it's not your thought. Stop trying to wish the thought away. Talk to the being. Did you see what the devil did to Jesus? Each time he spoke to Jesus, Jesus never said, God forbid. <laughs> Jesus never wished Satan's words away. He never wished Satan's voice away. Jesus spoke back to Satan intelligently. He responded intelligently. Responded intelligently. Sometimes some believers have negative thoughts coming from demons to them. And you just go, go, go for be blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Well, what do you mean? What are you doing? What are you doing? You've been doing it for years. After 27 years of being a Christian, you are still at that level, blood of Jesus, at, at evil thoughts. No, speak to the spirit. Don't wish the thought away. Talk to the spirit. You know, sometimes when you talk about these things, believers are scared. Ah, spirit. Ah, I don't want to be seen spiritual. You, you don't have any choice. Because see, whether you are spiritually aware, all right, of the spirit world or not, <laughs> the spirit world is around you. Do you understand? Get that. Get that in your head. <laughs> Let it pass through the... <laughs> Pass through your head, the thick skull. Let it enter. Let it enter. Whether you're spiritually alive to the spirit world or not, the spirit world is around you. It's around you for a number of reasons. Number one, on the basis of what you are. Do you understand? You're a spiritual being. 
You are a spiritual being. You are a spiritual being. You are a spiritual being. Some believers have struggled with negative emotions. Negative emotions. Now, we understand the place of negative emotions that as a result of over time mismanaging, you know, as a result of being indisciplined, all right, in your heart. You've mismanaged. When the believer has, you know, been lazy in, 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 in you know, you know, taking authority in properly managing under the under the truth of God, properly taking responsibility, all right, for 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 his thoughts, for his soul, for his emotions. Now, when a believer finds him in that kind of a state, he will create a condition, all right, where you know his own thoughts, all right, or where he makes himself susceptible to dark thoughts. You see, that as a result of him over time. All right, learning to think darkness, learning to think darkness is like habits. You see, it's like habit formed. You know, when habits have formed and have solidified, you see, at the first layer of struggle, what the person is in contention against, all right, is himself. At the first layer, it's not just spirit, it's himself. You know, something you continue to do over time. You see, first and foremost, you are perfecting something. You are learning a habit. You are learning a habit. It's like certain things you, 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 you grew up seeing that you've come to learn with your body. You see, you've come to learn. Have you seen people who have, who have PhD in hissing? They can hiss. They can hiss. Personally, <laughs> it took me years to learn how to hiss. <laughs> took me years to learn how to. Some people will hiss. The, when they hiss, <laughs> you will think it's a gift, it's an anointing. <laughs> it's a habit that they've learned. They've mastered it. You know, you, you know. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, show you very simple things. Because by principle, it cuts across. It cuts across. You see how children living around their parents just pick up their parents' habits just by observation. Just pick it up. Now, you see, the same as it were applies when it comes to your heart. You see, when you continue to indulge, when you continue to indulge in things that the word of God clearly has spoken about, you know, clearly has spoken against, for it, first, you are you are learning, you are, you are learning a habit. You are, you, are, you are giving your heart the opportunity of mastering darkness, which in the future will become the first basis of your struggle. So in the, in the future, all right, when that thing is solidified, all right, the first wall, the first wall, you see, of opposition you will experience, you will face, all right, is your own self. Your own heart. Your own heart. You see, so, so there is that. There is that. When, for example, take for example, when a person, all right, by not taking heed to the word, all right, continually gives himself to the habit of anxiety. Have you seen people who worry, who have a gift, as it were? They have a gift of worrying. They can worry. It's because they learned it. They practiced it and now they've perfected worrying. You see, they know how to worry. You see, they know how to worry. You see, they've mastered the art of anxiety. I mean, what the scripture says in chapter four of Philippians, all right, it says be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. It's something you must practice. You don't feel like to do it. It's something you keep doing until it becomes a habit to not be anxious for anything. The same way some people 
have disregarded such scriptures and have perfected the habit of being anxious for everything and anything. They are anxious, very anxious. They are not very old. They are not, now that anxiety which they've perfected is now the is now the bane of the problem, the health challenge they now have in their old age. Have you seen people who, who worry a lot? Because see, listen, when the believer disregards these injunctions, this instruction of the word, all right. Listen, amongst other things, it will go a long way, all right? It will go a long way making life difficult for you. Difficult for you. Difficult for you. Have you seen believers who more, more, who know how to more, more? That's what happens. And you know one thing about habits of the heart? Listen, habits of the heart. It doesn't matter how old you get, you see? Because you see, bodily you may grow old. Your heart never grows old. <laughs> Your heart never grows old. Your heart, that's why I see some old people in their old age, they are like babies. Have you seen old people like that? They are problematic. Now, see, I'm saying with all humility, all right, I'm not trying to make fun, no. You see some other old people, older, older people, all right? They are, they are calm, there are no problems to be around. Some old people, they can nag. Their children don't want them around. Have you seen a parent like that? Their children don't want them around. You say, mommy can talk or daddy can talk. Daddy will wear your life out, we talk. No, it, see, those are not symptoms of old age. No, it's not true. That theory is incorrect. When they tell you that when people grow older, they become children. No, it's not true. Yes, of course, maybe the point I want, their body, because of the weakness of the body. But you see, listen, your heart is the same. Your heart is the same. You see, see, so the habit, the practices you indulge your heart in today, all right, with your heart perfect today, all right, is what your heart will be like 50 years from now, 70 years from now. 200 years from now, you see, 172 years from now, the same, the same. And I've said, I think we've touched on this in different series, but I think I talked, I talked a little bit on it in two meetings ago, two Sundays ago, all right? So when believers even pass on, when they leave the earth, when believers leave the earth by death, when they go to heaven, see, the habit of the heart follows you. Listen, listen. The habit of the heart follows you. Oh, yes. I was shocked years ago, ago when the Lord showed me this in some experiences. The habit of the heart follows you everywhere. Yes, with your salvation, it will follow you. So when you see somebody who, a believer, full of the Holy Ghost, tongue talking, all right, but has perfected the art of anxiety. This person has an impartation for being anxious. It will follow the person to heaven. I'm telling you. When you see believers, who, have, who know how to nag? Who know how to nag? You know, some men complain about nagging wives. <laughs> or you see believers who know how to keep malice. See, malice, see these things, see, because of how, what man is like, because of how you are designed, you are not a brain. Hello? Listen carefully. You are not a brain. See, your brain is in your body. You are not just a body. Do you understand that? That is why there is nothing man does, all right, that does not involve the essence of his heart. There is nothing. That is why Jesus said in the book of Matthew, all right, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, a man performs. You see, that's a summarization of what Jesus said. Because he says in Matthew, out of the abundance of the heart, all right, the mouth speaks. It says, for a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart. So everything comes from your heart, everything. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things, Jesus says. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth evil things. So there is nothing you do that does not involve your heart. There is nothing. So when, listen, listen, 
I'm tying up a couple of things now. So when the spirit of truth, through the instruction from scripture, warns you against sin, against sin, listen, it's not for God's good. It's for your own good. <laughs> it's for your own good. It's for your own good. Because see, sin, not just the act, not just the act, all right? Not just the act, A-C-T, but the act, A-R-T, the practice of it, the practice of it wears, it wears, it wears upon your heart. It produces weakness in the heart and your heart is eternal, is eternal. So when a person, when a person, and indulges in the in 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 the in the practice of lust of lust. See, it's not just the issue is not just the act a c t. The issue is the act a r t. You see, by engaging in such, all right, he is constituting weaknesses in his heart. All right that will affect your engagement of eternal things here and your engagement of eternal things there. Do, do you understand that? So if the person leaves the earth now, he goes to heaven, the weakness will follow him. Do you understand? It will, the weakness will translate, all right, into what? Into instability of the heart. You don't want to know. You don't want to know. All right, what the eternal impact that malice has on saints who have got into heaven. Malice, when there's something, you just shut down. There's an issue, you don't want to talk to anybody. You, you, you keep malice for one year of your life. <laughs> Do you understand that? No, you don't want to know. Listen, I'm not kidding you, all right? I'm speaking to you by God. You don't want to know how that has affected saints, saints who went to heaven. You know, the effect of malice, malice on their hearts. See, listen, it's no joke. It's no joke when here and now there, all right, because of some of these things, your heart is incapable, you see, of translating the transmission of divine glory. You're in heaven now. Your heart is incapable of translating, of converting the transmission of divine glory, as it were, in quote, into what? Edible, you know, digestible form for the sustenance of your being. Do you understand? Do you understand? When you're in heaven, you are seeing things. You are seeing things. You are seeing lights. So that your case doesn't become like those people, in a sense, it's like a parable now. Who God spoke over Jesus. This is my son, hear him. What did the people say? He said he thundered. They heard thunder. <laughs> Meanwhile, God spoke in clear, intelligible word, words. But they were hearing thundering. I'm telling you. Glory to Jesus. Glory, glory to Jesus forever. Forever. Glory to God. So, um, think about this. If you would, and you can, get this teaching immediately after. Listen to them. It's an ongoing series, all right? No rush. No rush. Like I said earlier, consider it a course. But I bet you, all right? I bet you that it's a course that will change, that will change your life. Change your life. Change your life. Change your life. So see you again. See you again next week, Tuesday. 7 p.m. plus 1 GMT. The grace of God is multiplied to you.
through the knowledge, the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. See you again. Stay blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.